uh, today um, I would like to uh, invite you to open uh, your Bibles with me uh, in the book of Romans, <laughs> in the book of Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2, uh, that's after the book of Acts. Uh, if you are in First Corinthians, you are about one mile too far, <laughs> so you have to kind of go back. Uh, the book of Romans chapter 12, um, verses 1 and 2. Uh, I did talk about this uh, Wednesday, uh, sometime last week, uh, like uh, <laughs> Uh, Sister Sherry said, uh, well, I have to be in church to remember what day it is. <laughs> so it's been, it's been a little busy. So um, whenever last time I was here, uh, whenever I talked about that before, Romans, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and, and 2, and we read, um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be conformed, be, be conformed by the renewing of your mind. Be, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, do not be confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I guess I'm getting disoriented. <laughs> I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So, like I said, we talk about these two verses a little bit more before. So, this we are going to use those two verses as a foundation, as a blueprint. To, uh, uh, to what I am going to talk about. I want to talk to you about a living sacrifice and how you can use your five senses, how you use your five senses to live as a living sacrifice, how you use your vision, how you use your five senses to live that living sacrifice. So, um, I'll give you a little bit background on, on the passage before we kind of delve into uh, the five senses. So, uh, Paul said, therefore, brethren, um, therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Uh, last time I did a little bit of a survey I asked the group, when was the last time somebody used the word beseech? We didn't find one. Do we have one today? <laughs> so, if we find one today, then uh, we'll talk a little bit to say, okay, what's, what's going on? Uh, what planet you live in? Um, so, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So, when you see the word therefore, what do you do? When you see the word therefore, when you are going through the scripture, you see the word therefore, what do you do? You look for what it is there for. So, based on the fact that um, we've been justified by faith, we've been adopted into the family of Christ, we've been placed on their grace and not law, giving the Holy Spirit to live within us, we have the promise that God will help us in time of affliction. We have the assurance of standing in God's election. We have the confidence of the coming glory. We have the confidence that Jesus Christ is coming back to gather us to himself because there he is where we may be out. We might be also. And we also uh, have the confidence um, that we, there is no separation between us and the love of God. 
There is no angels, there is no hell, there is no power, there is no kingdom, there is no authority who can snatch us from God, from the love of God, the mercies of God. Therefore, by the mercies of God. So when you look at the mercies of God, how big the magnitude, the only thing you can do, the only thing that is reasonable you can do is to offer your life. I can little take your note. That's the only thing you can do. That's the only thing that is reasonable. After we look at the mercies of God, that's the only thing you can do. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. So now we find out what the dare is for. Uh, we are going to look into uh, the five senses and how to be this living sacrifice used in, in view of those five uh, senses. So somebody tell me what the five senses are. All right, thank you. Thank you. We did it. <laughs> so just that by itself, so you are already ahead of the game, okay? You are already ahead of the game. So you pass this quiz. No problem. <laughs> so um, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies as living sacrifice. And we do that. Let's look at vision. Uh, let's look at vision. Um, there was uh, a sick man um, who went to the doctor. Uh, making sure your senses are, are intact as well, okay? <laughs> so this sick man went to the doctor, and um, if we everywhere hurts, if he's in pain everywhere, doctor says, touch your head. Oh, that hurts so much. Touch your foot. Oh, I'm dying. It, it hurts so much. You know, you touch your stomach. Oh, it hurts. You know, touch your feet. Oh, that, that hurts so much. Doctor said, fool, you have a dislocated finger. <laughs> so, so we need to make sure. <laughs> so we need to make sure our senses are in time, okay? <laughs> so we make sure our, our senses are not dislocated. Uh, so vision, vision. Uh, what, I think what I'd like you to do, uh, if you don't have the time to kind of go through all the verses, I'm going to give you some verses for each, each um, sense. So you can kind of write it down, and I want that to be somewhat of a template. So you can actually practice. I'm going to give you a prescription. Don't worry. I'll give you a prescription. Don't worry. At the end, I'll give you a prescription. Um, well, who knows? That might cure the coronavirus. I'll tell you this prescription. <laughs> so vision, vision. So in Luke chapter 19, verse 4, we read about, in terms of vision, we read about the story of Zacchaeus who ran ahead. He knows Jesus Christ was coming. So he ran ahead and climbed into a tree to see who? To see Jesus because he was, he was short. So he realized, look, I'm short. Um, I don't have um, um, long legs. And Jesus is coming. And I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. I don't want to see Jesus. So what he did, he ran and climbed up on the tree to make sure you know, nobody won him over. And he was a tax collector. Uh-oh. This is not a very good resume here. That's not the, that's not the best. Uh, that's not the best thing you want to put on your resume. I mean, they make good money, but guess what? Everybody hate them. You see how you, you know, like paying taxes is not something people are just like, get excited or excited to go pay your taxes, you know? Uh, well, this guy is not only where they making the people pay taxes, they were um, ex exploiting the people, right? So the more the more taxes they charge, the more money they have that go in their pocket. So now, now you can imagine, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll pay my taxes, you know, I'll pay, pay the normal amount. Now you have somebody saying like, look, you know, I'll charge you double, you know? Nobody, nobody, everybody hate him. So he's short. And first of all, the people are thinking like, what are you doing here? Are you lost? You are a tax collector. You are a sinner. You're not supposed to be anywhere close to Jesus Christ. At least that's what the people thought. So there are a few items here 
in this very little first of all an adult Jewish man does not want that's shameful that's indignifying you just don't do that that's a lot of shame you just don't want you are an adult you don't want you don't do that so he's warning that like, I don't care about what anybody think I'm, I want to see Jesus Christ I, I want to see I want to see him I want to see him for who he is he's a tax collector everybody hate him because the tax collector is like that's the guy who's abusing, you know, everybody. You know, the 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 the, gate, the, uh, the door of heaven is not open for you for everybody else, but not for you. After all the abuse you put us through, so he's warning that's shameful. Uh, he is a tax collector. Everybody hate him. And another thing, he climbed up the sycamore tree. Well, on those days, the way he dressed. Are you guys with me? <laughs> the way he dressed, you don't want to be exposing anything up there. Right? So you don't want to expose, you know, his private parts. Uh, like, I don't care about the shame. I don't care that I'm a tax collector. One thing I do know. I want to see Jesus. A desire to see Jesus. Do you have a desire to see Jesus. Somewhere else in the Bible, in Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The psalmist is talking about the light, the, the word of God as the light to guide you safely. To guide you safely. To guide you in the midst of darkness. And we do need that. We do need the word of God. We do need that guiding light. And this world of confusion, this world of division, this world of uh, political pundits destroying each other. And then not only do they do that, they are trying to get you to follow them. They are trying to get you to fight with each other. That's what's in the media. So you need the light. You need the word of God. You need to be able to focus, focus on God to actually be able to see. You need that light. You need to see that light. You need to see that guiding light to help you sort out what is true, what is false, what is divisive. So you can focus on your true king. You with me? Uh, so this is what uh, we do see. So, let, um, so we fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and we focus on the word of God. That is able to lead us, to show us where we need to go to lead us to safety. In uh, the book of, uh, so hearing is the second word I'll talk about. In the book of 2 Timothy, verse 3, verse um, 16 to 17, we talk about the scripture, how it is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, uh, for correction in righteousness. And then we also see that. Uh, in the book of James, verse um, James chapter one, verse nineteen, it says, "Everyone should be quick to listen, listen, hearing, right? Uh, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry." Now we have to be very careful what we are listening to, right? Um, in uh, the book of First Samuel. Chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. Um, let me refresh your memory what happened in those first three chapters in the book of 1 Samuel. So there was this family. Um, you remember Elkanah? Right, that's not any name you give your kids, your grandkids. Uh, Elkanah and Hannah. They were husband and wife. You remember that? And Hannah would go to pilgrimage, you know, going to the priest, to the prophet, asking for what? Asking for a son, asking for a child. Right? Uh, so she was praying and she was in remorse. She was, you know, if you, in, in that culture, if you don't have a child, it's like you're less than a human. So you can imagine the grief, the torment, not having a kid. And she has a husband. So she's there crying and wailing, and um, Eli, remember the prophet? That was the prophet of the nation, the prophet of the day. So Eli said, uh, you are drunk this early in the morning? 
And then this poor woman is crying, saying, no, you're, you're my, my Lord, I'm not drunk. Just um, a woman in grief, you know, seeking for, uh, to have a child. And then the prophet said, this time next year, what's going to happen? You're going to have a child. So, uh, so the, that time next year, what she did, she went back to the prophet. Uh -oh. Don't forget who's giving you the blessing. She, she went back to the prophet. What she does, this is her only key. This is her only son. So she went back to dedicate <coughs> the son to the Lord under the leadership of the prophet Eli. Now, Eli might have been a prophet, but Eli had a very, very dysfunctional family. Now, this may not be in the front of your mind right now. Eli had two sons, Hafni and Phinehas. Those were really bad boys. Those were bad boys. And then this is where Elkanah and Hannah took their son to be mentored by Eli. What do you mean? If those two sons are bad boys, and Eli is supposed to be responsible father to raise those kids in the, in the admonition of the Lord. Now you take your son to be raised, be mentored by the God? That's exactly what Elkanah did. That's exactly what Hannah did. Submit the child with trust in God to be raised by, to be mentored by the prophet of the day, Eli. Here is young Samuel, which is the son of Hannah el Elkanah. The Lord has been working with on his case. The, on one good day, the Lord was calling him because he had a message for him. Be careful who you listen to. Samuel has no business listening to Afni or Phinehas. Those kids would come, the prophet, uh, the, the priest, offering sacrifice to God. They come and take whatever portion of the food they want. No regards for the sacrifice. No regards for anybody. No regards for Afni. Eli said, no, I, I, I didn't call you. Do you see what's going on here? Eli is such a such bad place. He cannot even hear the word of God anymore. He cannot hear the voice of God. Then he realized, wait a minute. It's the Lord calling you. So you go back to sleep. When he calls again, you say, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. You be careful what voices you hear to be able, you have to have a fellowship with the Lord to the point you are able to distinguish what voice is calling because there are many voices out there calling you left and right. So um, in terms of the sight of uh, the, the, the sense of hearing, we need to be quick to listen. We need to be quick to hear um, what the Lord has to tell us. And uh, the warning is you have to be careful who you listen to and what voice you hear. And be careful um, the Lord might have a prescription for you. It may not be very comfortable. Now the prophet Eli is declining. His relationship with the Lord is bad. And he said, speak, Lord. For your servant is listening. Oh yeah, you better listen because the Lord has a lot of instruction for you. And the Lord says, Samuel, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. It'll make your your ears squash a little bit. Come again. <laughs> Now, this is the introduction. This is like his first act. As the person was going to, 
who's going to replace Eli. So how do you go to your mentor and says, look? <laughs> if you read the rest of the chapters, you realize Samuel has having a very hard time to relay the message to his mentor. So basically, God is telling this young man who's, who's just not even being, really been initiated into the ministry yet. This is your first assignment. You are going to tell your mentor, Eli, that I'm going to kill him and I'm going to kill both of his sons. Uh-oh. Today, uh, young people will be like, Mom, are you sure this is what you want for my life? <laughs> I quit. This is his first assignment. Now, this is the prophet of the nation. And then here is this young boy. I'm going to kill you, prophet Eli. I am also going to kill both of your sons. And guess who's going to replace you? <clears throat> you remember what David went through when he had to replace the, the king? No, you're talking about you're talking about putting his life here, putting his life here uh, uh, at stake. First assignment. You remember when, when you tell there's going to be war. And you are, when I give you that message I'm going to give you, it's going to make everybody kind of scratch their ear and like, come again. Tell your master, the prophet for the nation, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill both of your son, and I'm going to replace you. <laughs> That's his first assignment. So when it comes to hearing, you need to make sure you hear what you are hearing, and then your response to the Lord is, yes, what is your assignment? The answer is yes. What is the assignment uh, you have for me? Smell. Uh, smell, on, in the second verse of uh, what the last passage we, uh, we read, it say, um, no, in the, the first verse, it talks about offering your body as, as a sacrifice. Uh, so we can parallel this concept of a sacrifice um, as the practice of the Old Testament. Uh, in the book of Leviticus, most of you, that's where most people quit. <laughs> okay, when you get to Leviticus, like, okay, yeah. Uh, animals with four feet and the one with hooves and people like, no, no thank you. Uh, so that's why people kind of like stop reading the Bible. So uh, in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 18, it talks about an offering, which is a bird offering. And then that's kind of what we see that it's like a, uh, an offering that is offered to the Lord. And the qualification of that offering, it has to be uh, without blemish, it has to be clean, it has to be uh, without spot, it has to be like a sacrifice that is clean. If the sacrifice is not clean, the Lord is not going to accept it. You see that as early as... Cain and Abel in the garden of Eden. If the sacrifice is not clean, the Lord is not going to accept it. So you present your body as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord. And if it's not holy, it won't be accepted. So when you come, when you present your body, you offer your body as a living sacrifice. The living sacrifice is one that is, um, that is holy, that is um, pure, that is without spot, that without blemish. You present that to the Lord. And when you do that in Leviticus, it says that as you put, put uh, take of, I want you to, be, to visualize that. Take when you put the, the lamb or uh, the sacrifice on fire, it burnt, and you can actually smell something. So when your sacrifice meets the criteria as to how an acceptable sacrifice to be offered, it is a good smelling. It's a good aroma unto the Lord. So it's a smell that pleases God. So this is what this is talking about. So when you present your body, you present your body as a living sacrifice without blemish. Um, you offer yourself to, to the Lord. Uh, and then the next one is, it's like we're running out of time, so <laughs> I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, but before I do that, let me um, go over this one passage. Do you know? Do you know where where God lives? 
Where does that live? <coughs> In the book of Psalm 22, I love that, 22 verse 3, it said, But thou art holy, O that thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. God lives, <laughs> God dwells, God dwells in the midst of praise. So when you are praising God, you consider yourself sitting around with angels and God is in the very middle of it. And it says that in the book of Matthew too, like when where two or three are gathered, I am in the midst of them. So when you are praising God, you, God is what in the middle of that place. Okay. This is where God lives. And Isaiah said, you know, I saw the Lord high and exalted. He seated on the throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Full of God. And then it was surrounded by different type of angels. So when you offer your praise, God, that's actually where God lives. That's what please God. So if somebody asks you what God has for breakfast, praise. What God has for snack, praise. What God has for lunch, praise. What God has for dinner, praise. God lives in the midst of, of praise. Uh, number four is to taste. And in the book of uh, Psalm 34, verse 88, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Experience God. When you experience God, you see that God is good. And he, was not, he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. When David was the, uh, on the most wanted, the headed list, God was with him. David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. His son Absalom was about trying to kill him. The king was trying to kill him. He was warning. He didn't have a place to stay. He didn't have a place to live. Because everywhere he goes, he was like walking in the shadow of his death. People see him around. They go and tell the king and the king packed his army and go try to kill him. David experienced God. And see that the Lord live God. Live for God. And experience God. And then you see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And touch. The last one is touch. Uh, we see a woman with issue of blood in Luke chapter 8 verse 43. There was a woman having an issue of blood for 20 years. That if only I could touch the hem of his dress, the hem of his robe. Do you have that kind of faith? Like an anger, like a thirst. I want to touch you. I want to feel you. And there is one day, the book of Revelation is going to wipe your everything. It's going to touch you and remove every tear. Every tear says the multitude wanted to touch the hem of his garment. There is healing. There is healing in the touching of his garment. Mm -hmm. You might just be an ambassador for Christ. You might be the one who put a hand on somebody and, and, and bring healing. Touch. May the Lord touch you. May you touch the Lord. And yes, I have a prescription for you. But this week, in your devotion, in your interaction, I would like to be thinking about in your prayers. Please touch me. I don't want to touch you. I want to touch. You. I can touch the hem of your garment. Please help me to touch you. Or let help me feel your touch. I, I want to see you. I, I want to see you. I want to see you. And there is nobody's opinion that is going to prevent me from seeing you. Just like Zacchaeus did. Away with shame. Away with bad reputation. Away with being short. I want to see you. My desire is to see you. And I'm not afraid. <coughs> So this is what I would like you to do 
over this week. And if there's anyone here who have not experienced the Lord before you leave today, please come, come talk to one of us. Come talk to Brother George or, 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 or Deacon uh, Lucas or uh, come talk to Brother Brad. Come, come talk to me. We don't want you to live without that assurance, without this hope we have in Jesus Christ. And you can only experience that. David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. And you, you need to have an experience with him to be able to see his goodness. May God richly bless you. And I will see you tonight, I believe. <laughs> I believe I will see you tonight. And please continue to pray for, for Pastor David. God bless you and may you be encouraged.